Welcome to Logic Over Faith. Since the dawn of human thought, people have wondered what makes them who they are. What is it that looks out through their eyes, thinks their thoughts, and feels their emotions? For thousands of years, religions and philosophers have answered with a single word. The soul. A mysterious, invisible essence said to be separate from the body, eternal in nature, and the true core of human identity. But when we look closer, when we examine what evidence actually exists, the idea of the soul begins to look less like truth and more like a deeply comforting illusion. The belief in a soul probably began as a natural misunderstanding of how consciousness works. In ancient times, people did not know what the brain was or what it did. They saw dead bodies and noticed something important. The body remained, but the person seemed gone. It was natural to ask, where did that person go? What left the body? The idea of a soul seemed like an easy answer. But this answer came not from evidence, but from the limits of early understanding. Even today, many people hold on to the idea of the soul because it feels comforting. It offers the promise that death is not the end, that our loved ones still exist somewhere beyond this world. It tells us we are not just flesh and neurons, but something deeper and sacred. Yet when science studies consciousness, memory, and emotion, the results tell a very different story. The things we used to call the soul, our thoughts, feelings, personality, are all products of the brain. They depend entirely on physical processes. When the brain changes, the mind changes. This is not a theory. It is a fact that doctors, psychologists, and neuroscientists see every day. A blow to the head can erase years of memory. A stroke can alter a person's personality. A tumor pressing on the frontal lobe can turn a kind person aggressive. Even small changes in brain chemistry can cause depression, anxiety, or hallucinations. If a person truly had an eternal, independent soul, none of this should happen. The soul, being separate from the body, should not be affected by physical damage. Yet every observation shows that our thoughts, memories, and emotions depend completely on the brain. When the brain stops, so do we. Consciousness is not a ghost in the body. It is the result of billions of neurons communicating in complex patterns. When those neurons stop firing, the signal of consciousness ends. Religions, however, describe the soul as something immortal, created by a god, and destined for an afterlife. But none of these claims have any evidence. No one has ever found a trace of a soul leaving a body. Every attempt to detect it, whether through weight measurements at death or supposed ghost photography, has failed. What we call a soul is simply the brain in action, nothing more and nothing less. Take memory, for example. If memory were stored in an immaterial soul, then damaging the brain should not erase it. Yet Alzheimer's disease can destroy decades of memories. People forget their own names, their families, their past. Their sense of self fades away. If the soul truly held all personal experience, it would remain intact regardless of brain decay. But this is not what happens. The loss of memory proves that the self is built from brain structures, not from an invisible spirit. Then consider cases of brain injuries where personality changes completely. There is the famous example of Phineas Gage, a railroad worker in the 19th century. An iron rod accidentally shot through his skull, damaging part of his frontal lobe. He survived, but his personality was never the same. He became impulsive, angry, and irresponsible. His friends said he was no longer Gage. What changed, his soul or his brain? The answer is obvious. When his brain changed, so did his mind. The soul had nothing to do with it. Some may argue that the soul is the observer behind the brain, the awareness that experiences everything. But even that idea collapses under examination. When a person goes under general anesthesia, their consciousness disappears entirely. Hours pass, but to them it feels like no time at all. There is no dream, no awareness, no floating soul observing from above. The moment the anesthetic wears off, Awareness returns, just like a machine turning back on. The experience of consciousness depends on a working brain. No brain activity, no awareness, no awareness, no self. Others say they feel certain that they have a soul because they can sense it. But feelings are not evidence. People also feel that the sun goes around the earth, yet it does not. The feeling of having a soul is simply the mind's natural illusion of unity. 
the brain creates a sense of self, a feeling that there is a single I inside controlling everything. But neuroscience has shown that this I is just the combined activity of many brain regions working together. There is no single place in the brain that contains the self. It is an emergent property of the entire system. Think about how your mind changes depending on your state. When you are drunk, your personality changes. When you are sleepy, your thoughts become different. When you are under stress, your emotions distort your decisions. All these experiences prove that what we call the self is fluid, dependent on chemistry and context. It is not a fixed, eternal soul, but a dynamic process constantly changing with the brain and body. Even our sense of morality and empathy, which many religions claim come from the soul, can be explained by evolution and neuroscience. Empathy arises from mirror neurons, brain cells that allow us to feel what others feel. Morality evolved because cooperation increased the chances of survival in social groups. These are biological, not spiritual phenomena. The idea that goodness or compassion comes from an invisible soul is unnecessary. Our biology already explains them. When we look across cultures, we see that every religion defines the soul differently. In Hinduism, it is the Atman, reborn again and again. In Christianity, it is created once and judged after death. In Buddhism, the soul does not exist at all. Only a chain of causes continues. If there truly were one eternal soul, the same for all humans, why would every culture describe it in a different way? The reason is simple. The soul is not something discovered. It is something imagined. Even modern claims of near-death experiences do not prove the soul. These experiences can be reproduced by stimulating certain parts of the brain or by depriving it of oxygen. The bright light, the tunnel vision, the feeling of floating. These are all known effects of a brain under stress. Pilots who experience extreme G-forces sometimes report similar sensations. The mind, when close to losing consciousness, creates illusions. It is not a glimpse of the afterlife, but a hallucination created by a brain in crisis. When we understand how powerful the brain is at creating experience, the mystery of the soul begins to fade. The mind is not a separate ghost trapped in the body. It is the body's most advanced function. Every thought, every memory, every emotion is an electrochemical event. We may wish that something more exists beyond death, but wishing does not make it real. In fact, the idea of the soul often prevents us from fully understanding ourselves. When people believe they have a separate spiritual self, they ignore the importance of mental health, brain chemistry, and social influence. They treat sadness as weakness of the soul instead of an imbalance in the brain. They look for salvation instead of therapy, and prayer instead of understanding. The belief in the soul can delay progress in science and medicine because it replaces investigation with superstition. Consider how much human progress came from rejecting the idea of an immaterial soul. When we learned that mental illness was not demonic possession but brain dysfunction, treatment became possible. When we discovered that memory and emotion depend on brain structures, we could begin to heal trauma. Science replaces fear with knowledge. It shows that understanding the mind requires understanding the brain, not worshipping a myth. Still, many argue that the soul must exist because humans are more than animals. They say animals do not have self-awareness or moral sense. But science has shown that many animals possess both. Dolphins recognize themselves in mirrors. Elephants mourn their dead. Primates show empathy and fairness. The difference between us and other animals is one of degree, not kind. We evolved higher intelligence but not a separate spiritual essence. The idea that humans are special creations with immortal souls is based on pride, not evidence. If we let go of the illusion of the soul, life becomes no less meaningful. In fact, it becomes more precious. Knowing that our consciousness is temporary makes every moment valuable. Love becomes more powerful because it is not eternal. It is fleeting and real. Joy becomes deeper because it belongs to this one life not a promise of another. When people believe they have eternal souls, they often waste the only life they truly have, waiting for one that will never come. We do not need the idea of a soul to explain consciousness, morality, or purpose. We only need to understand how the brain and body create experience. When we accept that the self is a process, not a spirit, we see ourselves more clearly. We understand that the I inside us is an illusion created by neurons, and that illusion, though temporary, is beautiful. The illusion of the soul is powerful because it touches our deepest fears, the fear of death, of loss, of nothingness. 
But truth does not bend to comfort. The fact that consciousness ends with the brain may feel cold, but it is also honest. And honesty is the foundation of real understanding. The belief in the soul has survived for so long because it speaks to our emotions more than our logic. It offers comfort where science offers cold honesty. It tells us we will meet our loved ones again. It assures us that our suffering has purpose, that justice will exist in some other world, and that who we truly are will never die. But comfort is not the same as truth. When ideas survive because they make us feel good rather than because they are supported by evidence, they become illusions. The soul is one of the oldest and most beautiful illusions humanity ever created, but an illusion nevertheless. Let us think about what actually happens to consciousness when the brain stops working. When a person falls into a deep coma, there is no awareness, no thoughts, no dreams. Weeks, months, or years may pass with no experience at all. When the brain wakes, the person says it felt like a single moment. That total absence of awareness is what death likely feels like. Nothingness, not darkness, because darkness is still something that can be perceived. People often find that idea frightening, but that nothingness is the same as what we experienced before we were born. We do not fear the billions of years of non-existence before our birth, so why fear returning to it? The mind fears it only because it cannot imagine what it means to not exist. Every scientific investigation into the nature of consciousness has led to one conclusion. Mental activity is brain activity. When neurons fire, we think. When they stop, thought stops. This is not philosophy. It is observable fact. Brain scans can now track decisions, emotions, and awareness in real time. They show patterns that predict choices before we consciously make them. This means that free will itself, another concept tied closely to the soul, may also be an illusion created by the brain. The feeling of choosing freely is just the conscious mind becoming aware of a decision the brain already made milliseconds earlier. The soul was once thought to be the seat of free will. But now we see that our choices arise from neural processes we barely understand. Religious stories about the soul always portray it as a separate entity that can survive death and face judgment. But if that were true, the soul would need to store every detail of our memories, feelings and experiences. Yet every piece of research into memory shows that these are stored in physical structures of the brain, networks of neurons that change as we learn, damage those networks and the memories vanish. If a soul carries memories into another world, where are those memories stored now? How do they transfer from neural tissue into an immaterial realm? There is no mechanism for that, and every attempt to imagine one adds new untestable assumptions. Another argument believers use is that near-death experiences prove the existence of the soul. They say people who were clinically dead describe seeing tunnels of light, dead relatives, or their own bodies from above. But these experiences can be reproduced in living subjects by stimulating specific areas of the brain or by reducing oxygen supply. When fighter pilots experience high gravitational forces, blood flow to the brain decreases and they often report seeing a bright tunnel and feeling detached from their bodies. That is the same pattern seen in near-death experiences. It shows the effect of the brain shutting down, not a soul leaving the body. Then there are cases of out-of-body experiences during surgery. Some people claim they floated above and saw the doctors operating on them. Yet studies have shown that when patients are given hidden visual targets in the room, like symbols placed above their heads, none of them can identify what they were. The experiences feel real, but they occur entirely within the brain, just like dreams. The illusion of the soul is also strengthened by language. We speak as if there is a separate me inside our heads controlling the body. We say, my body, or my brain as though the I is something apart from them. But there is no I apart from the body. The I is the body, and the body is the I. The sense of separation is a trick of consciousness, an emergent property that helps the organism organize experiences and make decisions. This illusion of duality was useful in evolution because it helped our ancestors imagine themselves as agents who could plan and act. But it does not mean there is a real spiritual self floating inside. Philosophers have debated the soul for centuries. The ancient Greek thinker Plato described the body as a prison for the soul. Descartes, in the 17th century, argued that mind and body were distinct substances, the famous idea of dualism. He believed the soul interacted with the body through the pineal gland. But modern neuroscience has shown no sign of any non-physical interaction. 
Every mental event corresponds to a physical event. When you decide to move your hand, neurons fire in the motor cortex, muscles contract, and the hand moves. There is no extra invisible step in between. On the other hand, philosophers and scientists who view consciousness as physical, like Hobbes, Darwin, or modern neuroscientists, see no need for a soul. They explain mind and self as natural outcomes of complex brains. The evidence consistently supports their view, not Descartes' dualism. If the soul truly existed and survived death, there should be measurable effects. People should be able to communicate with the dead, or memories should persist outside of a living brain. Yet all attempts to prove such things have failed. Mediums and psychics have been tested under controlled conditions many times. When there is no room for trickery or suggestion, their abilities vanish. The soul remains unproven because it is a story, not a phenomenon. Let us imagine for a moment that souls were real. Then what happens in cases of multiple personalities, known as dissociative identity disorder? Does each personality have its own soul, or do all share one? If one identity commits a crime and another feels guilt, which soul is responsible? These questions reveal how incoherent the concept becomes when we apply logic to it. The simplest explanation, that personality arises from brain processes, is the one that fits the evidence. Another fascinating piece of evidence against the soul comes from split brain research. In patients whose brain hemispheres were surgically separated to treat epilepsy, scientists discovered that each half of the brain could act independently. When the right hemisphere was shown an image that the left could not see, the right hand responded correctly, but the left hand did not. It was as if two separate streams of consciousness existed in one body. If there were a single indivisible soul, such division should not be possible. The experiments showed that consciousness can be split, merged, and altered according to brain structure. That means the self is not an eternal entity, but a product of neural organization. The illusion of the soul also arises because we humans have a hard time accepting finality. Our minds rebel against the idea that existence could simply stop. When we lose someone we love, the idea that they have gone forever is unbearable. So we imagine they live on in another realm. This desire to see them again gives rise to stories of heaven, reincarnation, and eternal souls. It is emotional necessity, not evidence, that keeps these beliefs alive. Understanding that there is no soul does not make life meaningless. On the contrary, it gives life true urgency. When you realize this consciousness is brief and fragile, you begin to value every experience, every relationship, every act of kindness. You see morality not as a divine command, but as a shared human contract that allows life to flourish. You find purpose in the present moment, not in a promised eternity. Without the illusion of the soul, human existence becomes a beautiful biological story, a spark of awareness in the vast universe, arising from atoms that once belonged to stars. The fact that consciousness exists at all, even for a short while, is miraculous enough. We do not need myths to make it sacred. In a way, the illusion of the soul is a mirror of human creativity. It shows how powerful imagination can be, powerful enough to convince billions of people that they will live forever. But understanding that it is an illusion does not destroy its beauty. It deepens our appreciation of why we invented it. The soul is a story we told ourselves to cope with the unknown. Now that we know more, we can tell a new story, one based on truth, reason, and awe for the real universe. When people finally accept that there is no separate soul, they do not lose their humanity. They gain it. They begin to see others not as immortal spirits trapped in temporary bodies, but as unique, fragile beings experiencing the same brief wonder of existence. Compassion becomes more urgent, not less. Meaning becomes self-made, not granted, and life becomes all the more precious because it is finite. The illusion of the soul may never completely disappear. It is too deeply tied to our fears and hopes. But as knowledge spreads, more people are learning to see consciousness for what it truly is, a natural process, no less amazing for being temporary. The soul does not float above us. It burns within the neurons that make us who we are. And when those neurons fall silent, what remains is not eternal torment or bliss, but the lasting impact we leave on the world and on each other. We can let go of the illusion without losing meaning. We can live fully without expecting eternity. Because the real miracle is not that we will live forever. 
it is that we are alive at all.